Welcome to Cryptic Accounts, a podcast by paranoid people for paranoid people. And this week on the show, we'll be covering the death of Karen Silkwood. I'm Patrick Ryan, joined by Dennis Cheney. Hi, Dennis. Hello, Patrick. How you doing, buddy? I'm all right. I'm pretty pumped uh, to hear this story. You've been working on it a while. Oh, uh, yeah. I've gone down a real government hole here lately. Uh, <laughs> this one is going to kind of tie in. Didn't plan on it being that way, but it kind of... Ends up that way, like it always does. Yeah, uh, that's otherwise we wouldn't have a show. We just have like ten minute nuggets. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, I will say thank you everybody for listening. Uh, wherever you're listening or watching this on iTunes, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, like, rate, subscribe, help us out. Tell your friends we appreciate everything you've been doing. All the comments, uh, even the not so friendly ones, we appreciate them. We still appreciate them. And yeah. uh, don't yeah. do that. We're not telling you to. Do that. <laughs> but if you've already done it, we're we rubbing it in your face. And it, just, it makes us happy. Did you hurt my feelings? Yes. Yes. Not mine. Will I show it? No. <laughs> but let's get into this because this is, it's a doozy. So, Karen Silkwood, Dennis, she grew up in Nederland, Texas, and uh, she was, she excelled in chemistry, and she graduated in 1964. She got a college scholarship and went to nearby Lamar College in Texas, uh, Lamar College, and uh, and that's in Texas. Uh, Karen pursued her science interests, settling on a career as a laboratory analyst, perhaps in nuclear physics. Before her sophomore year ended, though, she met and married Bill Meadows, and that kind of brought her college career kind of to an end. I'm not even, you know what? I honestly didn't catch if she finished. It nothing really noted that anyway. I don't. I think she might have finished, but she didn't pursue anything after that. This she week on Cryptic Accounts, the mystery of did Karen Silkwood finish college after she met her boyfriend? There are so many details to this story. That must have been one that I missed. To, it does, it's not going to matter here. You'll see. It's not going to matter here in a minute. So they moved to Texas where Meadows worked in the oil industry and Silkwood took care of their three children. After years of financial struggle, though, they finally ended up declaring bankruptcy Silkwood left him in 1972. So they weren't together that long, a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and she left because she discovered Meadows was having an affair with one of her friends. Aww. So she gave Bill custody of the kids, and she moved to Oklahoma City. There she found a job at Kier McGee's uh, Cimarron uh, River plant in Crescent. It's a nuclear power plant. Or refinery. Sorry. She must have got some degree then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm doing it. Okay, let's keep well, going. Well, <laughs> you're going to Okay. It's, again, sorry I don't have that detail. It's, you're going to see, it, the bar is not as high to get hired at this place as you would think it would be for the stuff that we're going to be dealing with. Okay. She's like Homer Simpson. Yeah. So... 30 miles north, okay, so 30 miles north of Oklahoma City is where this plant is, and she soon joined the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union. She walked the picket line not too long after that during a largely unsuccessful nine-week strike in 1972. So uranium, Dennis, a metal buried mostly in isolated pockets under western deserts that has uh, going to fuels that is, that is going to fuel, or was going at the time, to fuel tomorrow's generators. And the oil companies were in on the ground floor at the time. Kerr-McGee Corporation grabbed up all the uranium fields it could sink a shaft in. On a Navajo reservation near Shiprock, New Mexico in 1953, Kerr-McGee uh, Kerr uh, discovered a cache of uranium under the parched turf. The Navajos there were paid as little as $1.60 an hour to exhume the metal, hauling it out in wheelbarrows. Is that safe? Okay. No. No, it's not. Not at all. Like take wheelbarrows of uranium? Also, this is not like a, well, we found this out later. We knew that in the 60s. Like, we were pretty aware uranium may not be, like, you don't, we're not, like, making balls out of kids and handing them to kids. Like, or out of, uh, we're not making balls out of uranium and handing them to kids. Yeah. 
Well, man, I bet that uranium could fetch a lot more than a dollar sixty an hour if you gave it to some some Cap- bad some bad folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things you can do with uh, uranium, like make bombs. So after 16 years of plunder, the Navajo mines were exhausted in 1969. Only then, after those 16 years, did the miners learn that uranium dust had infected many of them with a rare lung cancer that resists early detection. So that's the fun thing about uranium poisoning. It's not like other cancers. There, it doesn't show up. Like you can't, and it, it, I don't know if things have advanced since then. At the time, though, it was when you found out it was pretty much you were pretty far along. That must be like I've heard stories like we try to assassinate like Castro by putting like uranium in his shoe. You know, like it must have just have that quality. You know what? And I bet that is probably about the time that this is happening in <laughs> the story. And that's going to make a lot of sense with this story. So just remember that. We'll put a pen in that. Okay. So within a decade, cancer had killed 18 of the 100 Navajo miners. Oh, wow. And later, many more. But Kerr McGee refused to take responsibility or pay any medical expenses. Quote, I couldn't possibly tell you what happened at some small mines on an Indian reservation. Kerr McGee spokesman Bill Phillips told a Washington reporter, quote, we have uranium interests all over the world. <laughs> How do you not know about uranium? Po- this is like way after Hiroshima. Yes. I'm I supposed to know just being around uranium all the time would harm you. <sighs> They couldn't, I guess. Obviously, based on what we know so far, they couldn't have possibly known. They couldn't have known. Robert Kerr, the company's co-founder, fought to keep unions at bay and workers at minimum wage as they worked with uranium. As Oklahoma governor in the 40s, he ran the state with frugality and didn't relax his tight fist until moving to the U.S. Senate in 1948. There, though... Kerr became the most powerful man in the Senate next to Lyndon Johnson. The energy, the energy industry won millions of dollars in tax subsidies, and nuclear research profited from fat bags of public dollars, to the exclusion of solar and geothermal research, in which Kerr McGee had absolutely no interest. Of course not. Now, Dean McGee, Kerr's successor as company board chairman, held office and influence in such diverse interests as banks, power companies, and the National Cowboy Hall of Fame. You gotta have diversified investments, Patrick. That's, I mean, man. (laughs) It's a very Texan, Oklahoman thing to do. I know, right? So, McGee looked to a time in the near future where a greater fuel than uranium would be produced and used. I'm talking about everybody's favorite, plutonium. Plutonium. Now, see, uranium is like fossil fuels. It's limited in supply, and we could eventually run out. But plutonium, Dennis, is the love child of an ultimate alchemy. It can reproduce itself. An industry brochure puts it like this. Question. How many pounds of plutonium will you have left after you use three pounds in a nuclear reactor? Answer, four pounds. What? I never heard that. It's, that's it, yeah, it's a thing. Wow, okay. Man, so, where's this going? I'm really excited to see where this is going. All right, let's keep going. So it's like a kind of, like, ever, like, you could potentially not run out of plutonium. But you're going to find that might be a problem that the more you use of something, the more of itself it creates. See, plutonium is incredibly combustible, readily convertible into nuclear weapons, and once let loose in the atmosphere, it stays deadly for a quarter million years. It cannot be recaptured or destroyed, Mm. swallowing it in any quantity that can be seen with the naked eye would sear the digestive tract, killing quickly and very painfully. Plutonium plutonium is also a carcinogenic killer. As little as a one millionth of a gram has induced cancer in lab animals, and some experts say that a softball-sized bag of plutonium 
if properly dispersed, could visit cancer on every home on Earth. That is terrifying. Back to the softball. Okay. <laughs> oh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because, yeah, that I, I, I've read this, I've read over all this a bunch, and that's the part that's really messed. Like, think of the size of a softball. That would be enough plutonium for everybody in the world to get cancer. Like, if you took the amount and injected it in us, right? Like, surely. Uh, surely more you, than a softball of plutonium exists out there, like. Oh, yes, it does. Oh. <laughs> Oh no! You're this gonna is gonna be one of those episodes. You're gonna I wanted. What? This is gonna be one of those. I wanted to be depressed because aliens were gonna probe me. Now I'm depressed because I'm gonna get cancer and die. Oh. Okay. So, it was Kerr McGee on good terms with the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC, since Robert Kerr's congressional days, which was awarded a 1.4 million dollar. AEC contract to process the plutonium into pellets and pour them into the fuel rods. Kerr McGee's plutonium plant, built next to one of its uranium plants, opened in 1970, shortly before 8,583 8, fish turned belly up in the river following a big ammonia spill at the new facility. Okay, it's just ammonia though. Yeah, I mean, we're yeah, that's it's no big deal. It's it's ammonia. We'll do fine with the plutonium. Who we're counted those fish? That is them. such a that is such an exact number. They could be like eight to nine thousand fish. They're like there was eight thousand five hundred eighty three fish. I'm sure they got collected somehow, and that's probably what made it to collection. Yeah. So maybe more than that, really. They know because they sold the fish. That's also possible. <laughs> to Indian reservations. Very possible. If you it, as we go along, you're gonna find that. That isn't that shocking of a statement, really. Like, if they could have figured out how to do it, they might have done it. So in a situation that left no margin for error, things kept getting bungled at the new plant. Contaminations from leaving storage containers open for days, leading to personal exposure to equipment defects, leading to contaminated air within the plant, protective gloves that had holes that the employees were wearing, and everything else from pipes to containers and any containers in general, really, they leaked quite frequently. With o- ocean oh, yeah. nightmare. This is plutonium leaking. Softball for the whole world. This stuff's just spilling over this plant. Oh, man. One day, a worker bent over to adjust a compressor unit. It exploded, ripping through his hand and tearing off the top of his face spitting tissue over this all over the ceiling. He died instantly, and quote, when I got there, remembered a former lab technician, they were washing the goo down the drain. Oh! Kerr McGee, he feels, didn't care about the people who worked there. It didn't care whether its safety program was effective or not. The face goo. All right, keep going. Yep, oh. face goo. Face goo. In April 1972, not too long before April or uh, before Karen got there, two maintenance men repairing a pump at the plant were splashed with a rain of plutonium particles, oh, no. which settled on their hands, their faces, their hair, and their clothes. Oh no! At noon, they left because it was lunchtime, and went to a nearby town not discovering their contamination until they returned. They were scrubbed clean, along with their car, but Kerr McGee neglected to check out the restaurant where the men had eaten. They also kind of neglected to inform the AEC of the incident at all, a clear violation of the federal nuclear code. The AEC was finally alerted to the affair, but it was a month later. They were tipped off by an environmentalist who had learned of it from a plant worker. By then, there was nothing that really could be done for the restaurant patrons, short of an all-out search for any who might have gulped down plutonium with their egg salad. Shame. So, beyond adding to the file of violations already logged against Kerr McGee, 
The AEC just forgot about the matter. That's power, man. That's well, you're going to find the AEC kind of may have a weird conflict of interest going on throughout a lot of this that doesn't really make sense on why anybody would set things up the way they did. Okay. But Karen Silkwood arrived at the Kier McGee plant in late summer 1972, eager to begin a career as a nuclear laboratory technician. But after only three months testing the plutonium fuel rods, Silkwood was outside the plant striking. Uh, I would I would be like a day for me once I saw face goo getting washed down a drain. Well, she wasn't there for the face goo yet. But I'm yeah. sure. I mean, and at the I'm rate sure things, people talk about face goo. As we go through this, you're going to find there was so much stuff happening so frequently. That one probably would have been buried by the time she got there. It would have had several months for other contaminations to happen. Oh. Other people to die. Like, it, there's plenty of time. So much is going to happen. So the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers International Union, OCA, representing the plutonium workers, was at a loggerhead at loggerheads with Kerr McGee. The company had managed to keep the unions out until 1966, three years after Senator Kerr's death. So she, you know he was just rolling in his grave, having to pay people above minimum wage to work with plutonium. The nerve of these people! He's like the real life Mr. Burns. He kind, I kind <laughs> That's of. That's like the you I can tell like, like Mr. Burns is based on these people. The only pop culture reference I have nuclear power plants is The Simpsons. It makes sense. The more you hear about these, you're like, oh, that might. I didn't look up pictures of them. I'll probably look up pictures by the time this goes up to video, and we'll pop some of those up, because I bet I wouldn't be surprised if one of them looks kind of like Mr. Burns. So now that Kerr was dead, though, Oka was demanding a new contract with higher wages, safer conditions, and better training. Just some real, you know, way out there asks that I, you know, they're asking for here, like decent pay, safe conditions. They want to be trained properly before they work with plutonium. Communists. That's what it sounds like to me, Dennis. That's what it sounds like to me. Kerr McGee replied with an offer worse than their old contract. Oh, man, hardball. So naturally, workers went on strike. And then the company rushed scabs onto the job of you, you refining uranium into plutonium. I can't stress this enough. They are refining uranium into plutonium in this plant. They did it so fast, they barely missed a beat in fuel rod production. production. Just right back to it. Even Kerr McGee officials later conceded in a letter to the Sierra Club, which is a group of activists, that uh, thrusting untrained strike breakers into the plant led to more plutonium spills and leaks. Some scabs got only four hours of training when they should have gotten five days. Among the inexperienced substitutes hired during the strike was the plant's safety officer. Just a day laborer, like, supervising a nuclear plant. Well, they gave him a handbook, I'm sure, so it'll be fine. Go down to Home Depot, find the first five guys, stand them outside the door, bring them in here, let's let them run the, the power plant. That is actually what they're doing. I mean, they're, <laughs> I know, that's they're, what they're doing. They're I doubt getting, like, migrant scientists. workers. No, literally, they're getting, like, migrant workers, um, farmers, like, uh, yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's it's question, like, you didn't really... It, it's questionable what kind of level of education you really needed to get in the door here. It wasn't much. Right. And it seems like even when you got up to like mid-level management, also you may not need to have that much experience or education to work with plutonium. You still have your full face. You're hired. This is the 1970s. This was yeah. not that long ago. <laughs> yeah. The strike lasted 10 weeks. Those picketers whose jobs had been lost to scabs returned to work in January 1973, reluctantly signing a new contract that stripped away many of their previous rights, including certain protections against arbitrary firing and reassignments. Because why would you need to have those protections? A few weeks later, a plant employee was emptying a bag of plutonium waste 
when a, when a fire spontaneously erupted, shooting radioactive dust into the air. Seven workers sucked in the junk, but Kira McGee's supervisors waited the day before calling in a physician. Well, let's see what happens. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's see how this shakes out. It's We don't know that much about this. this we're kind of new to plutonium. Also, I'm the safety director, and I've been here for all of a couple months, so or yeah. 10 weeks. I've been here 10 weeks at this point. Four days later, the seven workers still had not been tested for contamination in their lungs. Oh, no. Silkwood looked to the union as the only outlet for her growing frustration with the management. When suddenly, she was exposed to airborne plutonium in July of 1974. So she's been there like a couple months at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, it was only a matter of time at this uh, place. And it's because she was not wearing a respirator. And it's not because she didn't want to. For over a year, she had been bugging the company to buy a special respirator to fit over her tiny face. Uh, oh, what a crybaby. Oh, I have a tiny face. I need a respirator. I don't want to breathe plutonium. Which I think I quoted that wrong. It must have been other people complaining about the size of the respirator. She hadn't been there for a year at this point. She just started. Or no, she'd been there for two years. I'm sorry. Yeah, she'd been there since 72. She started in 72. Whew. Anyway. (laughs) All right, that makes more sense. It was a year then. Um, So um, it hadn't arrived at this point. So two years, she gets contaminated. She's been contaminated twice now? Uh, When union elections came up the next month, Silkwood ran and won one of the three state seats on the local 5283 uh, steering committee. Despite growing any company jabber at the plant, most workers did not want to fight. Many simply quit. The annual turnover rate among the 115 hourly workers, according to the union, hovered around 60%. Some complained of being harassed out of their jobs. Three workers who griped to the AEC officials about safety conditions early in 1974 were reportedly tracked down and transferred to undesirable positions in the cold warehouse. Oh, that doesn't sound like a nice... She didn't do a lot into the cold warehouse. They send a lot of people here that they're unhappy with, though. So I'm assuming it's just a big refrigerator or freezer, essentially. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's got a... It's, it's, got really stink- go. it's got a stink to be the punishment for not working in, like, Plutoniumville. Yeah. Uh, so other plutonium workers took their feelings outside the plant, anonymously phoning tips to environmentalist groups like the Sierra Club or Friends of the Earth. Several calls also went to Eileen Younghein, an Oklahoma City housewife, and I couldn't really clarify why everybody called this lady, but she was very popular in town. So people let her know what was going on. And she had read about the dangers of plutonium in Intellectual Digest and had written to local newspapers about it. Oh, yeah, cool. that's why. You can imagine how stunned I was when some workers called to tell me there was a plutonium plant under our very noses, she recalls. It was a short drive upwind from my house, and I hadn't known of it. What would happen if there was a big explosion at that plant? We'd have dead people all over the place. In addition, Young Hein learned the plant had been built on a floodplain and in the center <laughs> of a tornado alley. Great. A situation, Dennis, that required stowing all plutonium in a vault whenever there was a flood or tornado alert. <laughs> and there was actually no guarantee that the vault itself would not crack. Yeah, that seems like a really I wonder if that's the cold I wonder if that's the cold room. People just stood around with a bunch of plutonium in, like, this vault. That's, you know what? That might be what that is. I didn't see anything that said that. They, they refer to this as the vault, then there's a cold warehouse. Yeah. So all 900,000 people living within 50 miles of the plant, she figured, were living in the shadow of Armageddon. I felt betrayed by Kerr McGee, she said. They built that plant without telling anyone. I guess they thought no one would find out. Okay, hold on a minute. Who works at this place that nobody within 50 miles knows that exists? I mean, it's only been here for four years at this point. They already had the uranium plant. I think it's the fact that there's a plutonium refinery happening there Okay, now. maybe they didn't know that. Because that's the new thing. 
The okay. uranium was already uranium uh, processing facility was already there, along with a bunch of they had like a, a kind of a compound of different things going on there. Um, but the plutonium processing was a new thing, which was some, we're going to get into a little bit. It's called fast breeding, essentially. It's basically plutonium reproducing plutonium so that they can then ship it other places. Oh, <laughs> so it's less why I say it's like a nuclear reactor, like. I don't know. I'm not enough of a scientist to really understand. I know that the place could blow up and kill us all. Yeah. <laughs> so in my mind, that's, that's, that's close enough. They're dealing with nuclear material um, and they're refining it there. And yeah, they're doing the fuel rods and all that. And then shipping it up from here. Tons and I tons. I feel like tons of I live too close to this place. I, I felt that way as I read this too. I'm like, this could probably, if the wind blew right, could totally bring plutonium particles floating up here. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, at the time, Kerr McGee was preoccupied with a breakwater federal court ruling in New Jersey that ordered all nuclear companies to submit statements describing the dangers of nuclear plants, which again is baffling that they had not done this by this point as nuclear facilities are opening up across the country. They're just now like, oh yeah, we should probably, what's going on with this, you guys? Is there some danger to this? Tell us about what you're doing again. You think the government would just do it? There's a, you yeah, that's kind of what the AEC is supposed to be doing, but they're also kind of involved in facilitating and manufacturing and selling and all the processes that you wouldn't want an oversight committee involved in with the plant that's producing and then trying to sell these things. Oh, Lordy. Yeah. So, among other things, Kerr McGee was required to show their buddies at the AEC that neighbors of plutonium of the plutonium plant understood the risks and were willing to live uh, near them. In August 1974, the AEC received three letters, one from each of the city councils of Guthrie and Crescent, which are nearby towns, and one from the commissioner of Logan County, representing the citizenry of uh, the citizens closest to the plant. All three letters said the citizens were okay with the plant. Here's the thing, though, Dennis. All three letters were identical. Conspiracy. Well, confronted with the letter, uh, confronted later with the embarrassment, Guthrie City Manager R.E. Anderson mumbled, the company did give us a letter to look at, so we knew what they had in mind. I didn't realize we'd send it off without changing a few words. <laughs> they all three of them just used the same letter. Uh, that's, tax that's, dollars hard at work. Tax dollars hard great. at work. <sighs> so the same month that Kerr McGee was trying to impress the AEC with letters and triplicates, Karen Silkwood and the other two local 5283 steering committee members were preparing a declaration of war against Kerr McGee. New contract negotiations were due in a few months, and for the first time, Local 5 283 was going to confront Kerr McGee squarely on the issue of safety. They've been, they're kind of being whiny babies about it, I feel like, but they're going to confront him about safety, Dennis. Yeah, yeah. Most workers were young, average age was about 25, coming from nearby farms and small towns, and Silkwood learned, as a leading member of the union, Several of these young new employees had no idea plutonium could even give them cancer. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. With all these, yeah. I, oh, that's depressing, man. Yep, this is the 70s. This is the 1970s. New employees often were sent directly into production without any safety training at all. Production schedules sometimes forced workers to stay on the job even when the air wasn't safe to breathe supervisors ordering them to wear respirators rather than hunting down the source of a contamination, and plutonium was sometimes even stored in desk drawers. <laughs> I could find no extra details to this, but it was accounted many places, and you're going to see it was verified later. They found uranium, or plutonium, sorry, processed uranium, in desk drawers, I don't know if that's like you. I, I feel like that is a Homer Simpson thing. Like back to the Simpsons reference, like it falls in his shirt. He like plops it in a drawer. Yeah. <laughs> who has a plutonium? Who has plutonium? Is like, hey, 
I'm not going to walk back to the disposal or the clean plate. Why do I even have Just this? Put it thing? in the drawer. <laughs> Obviously, I'll put it in the drawer. I'm going to be in tomorrow. I'll take care of it in the morning. <sighs> or if they didn't know it caused cancer, it might have been like a novelty item. They'd be like, look at this, this plutonium. You know what? That would actually make the most sense. That because it like got encapsulated, it would get encapsulated in like plastic cubes almost. Yeah, like the little pellets or whatever. And so, I, you, yeah, it would almost be like a paperweight. Oh my gosh! Honestly, now that you to bring that up, I think that's probably what was happening. If I had to guess. Oh man, this is gnarly. Yeah. So with their grievances in, grievances in hand, and with the quickening hopes of the union membership. Silkwood and her fellow committee members, Gerald Brewer and Jack Tice, flew to Washington, D.C. for a meeting with the Alka International. They arrived on September 26, 1974, and met C- Steve Wadka, an Alka legislative assistant. Wadka and his boss, Tony Mazzucci, had devoted more of the previous year to hassling do-nothing regulatory agencies and exposing health hazards in the asbestos industry, a crusade that had won them praise from Senator Walter Mondal on the floor of Congress. So these are some guys who were actually trying to do some good. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So... Our good our, our our hero finds hopefully more heroes. Watka and Mizuchi pumped Silkwood and the others for details, then the next day marched them over to the only place in town that could put the clamps on Kerr McGee. The AEC. Dun dun dun. Oh man, that's a depressing. Well, Watka and Mizuchi. I all mean gonna this, end is, up. this is nobody really knows. I don't know that anybody really realizes what the AEC is doing at this point. So they all look at it as being this good thing. Because there are good scientists within the AEC, you're going to find out, that are screaming there's a problem. And then they usually get fired and stuff. But I feel like these three are going to end up suiciding themselves, man. Well. I No guesses. The AEC copied it all down and promised an investigation. But Wadka was already considering another investigation. Silkwood had confided and confided to him for months that she had suspected the test of the, uh, the tests on the plutonium fuel rods destined for Richland, Washington, were being fudged, and she had recently heard about records being doctored, X-ray photos being black penciled, and other tests being manipulated. Kerr McGee's plutonium plant might be defrauding the AEC, she had concluded, shipping the inadequate or unsafe fuel rods to Richland. So Silkwood agreed to go undercover. On October 10th, two of the nation's leading plutonium experts arrived in Oklahoma City from the University of Minnesota, summoned by the OCA International to conduct crash courses for Kerr-McGee's plutonium workers. Their Their credentials were impressive, Dr. Donald uh, Gessaman, a top AEC scientist for 13 years, had crusaded for stiffer plutonium standards at the AEC until he was fired. Dr. Dean Abramson was a physician, a a physicist and a physician and was very well respected. The two professors were told 73 workers had been internally contaminated by the plutonium during the previous four years. So they've been open for four years. 73 people have not, not, we're not counting uh, contaminations of like they got a little on their, their suit or their face. This went in their body. This is like I ate plutonium. They ate it or more likely in most cases they inhaled it. Yeah. They inhaled oh, that makes sense. Of plutonium. Because again, they didn't have respirators. They had holes in their gloves. Um, so, yeah, they probably ate some of it. Some of it probably got on their hands and stuff, and then they ate. So Karen Silkwood, as you'll remember, is one of those 73. And she was shocked to hear uh, that cancer could actually take t- 10 to 15 years to be detected. She had assumed she would stay clear of cancer if she did not breathe in more plutonium than allowed under AEC guidelines. But... Dr. Abramson told her, 
if you can measure the plutonium in the air at all, it's too high. Yeah. The, AEC, the AEC guidelines, he said, were completely meaningless. Oh. Oh, that'd be so nerve-wracking. The people in charge of safety aren't telling the truth about safety. Well. And, and then they, they fixed it. And... <laughs> it's weird that they sent these guys. So that was the only part that confused me about this. I'm like, they sent a guy they fired. And another doctor that's, like, respectable, which is kind of, I guess, what they did. They hired, like, real physicists and stuff that want to help and point out dangers. And just whoever this is at the top that's running it just doesn't want to hear any of that and just finds ways to work around it all. How much plutonium is safe to keep in your desk, though? I mean, not as much as you would like. (laughs) Oh, man. Not as much as you'd like. Not enough that you could see it, actually. In all reality, like you shouldn't be able yeah, to. Yeah, I figure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so Silkwood grew moody and restless. She began working nights and was unable to sleep during the days. She got a prescription for some sleeping pills, Quaaludes actually, and she began to hunt for another job. But first, she vowed she was going to get proof that Kerr McGee was sustaining its plutonium plant through false and perjurious records. She had already collected some evidence, she said, and was certain she could get more. At one point, Silkwood reported to Wadka that she had obtained photographs proving the welding on some fuel rods were too weak. That's the thing that's going to hold in the plutonium. Uh The seals on that, not super leak, which would make it so plutonium would leak out. Go back to your kids, Karen. (laughs) Causing problems. Silkwood spent the week of Oct- uh, uh, the weeks of October 1974 staying after hours, poring over files, recording every questionable procedure, building a dossier in a manila folder. She did not know, though, that other employees were beginning to notice her spying, and that the plant rumor mill was abuzz with suspicions about what she was up to. Three times in the past three week or three days, Karen Silkwood had been contaminated with plutonium. This is like the end of October. And no one knew, or I'm sorry, we're in November now. Um, And no one knew where it was coming from. A monitoring device had first discovered flakes of plutonium on her skin and clothing shortly after she reported for work on November 5th. She had quickly stepped under a brisk shower and rapidly, as if no time were left on the clock, Silkwood called Steve Watka. Hello, she said. Um, her voice kind of tottered, uh, please come to Oklahoma. Something very weird is happening here. She told me. Oh, no. Are they poisoning her? Mm. The next day, day two, monitor flashes again. More plutonium on her skin. Another shower. On the third day, the mystery repeated itself. And finally, Dennis... A nasal smear was conducted because, you know, I, you would think you would test for internal stuff on day one, but not at Kerr McGee. Uh, we give it three days. We like to wait. We don't like to waste the test kits. Um, and she found out she was contaminated internally. Again, she picked up the phone and this time called Dr. Uh, Abramson. She wanted medical advice from a physician. She told him that somehow, somewhere, she had gotten pl- uh, plutonium all over her, inside and out. Quote, she knew what the medical implications were, and she was worried, Dr. Abramson said. A team of Kerr McGee inspectors armed with alpha counters, full-face respirators, special galoshes, taped-up gloves, and white coveralls were, meanwhile, hunting the source of the plutonium. There had been no recent accident at the plant to account for her contamination. So at Silkwood's request, they had trekked to her apartment. Plutonium in small quantities was everywhere. Outside on the lawn, the inspectors filled a 55-gallon drum bag with her belongings, and they actually moved most of her furniture out, too. The plutonium trail turned hottest in the kitchen inside the refrigerator. A package of bologna and a package of cheese were the two most contaminated items in the apartment. Oh, they're mousetrapping her. Apparently, I mean, kind of, yeah, they literally use cheese. (laughs) Apparently, the plutonium had been tracked around the apartment from the refrigerator. 
but no one could explain how two sandwich foods had become the source of contamination. Well, I have a few ideas. Do you? Yeah. Maybe she was keeping plutonium in the fridge. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the apartment, we're, the apartment was sealed off and the AEC was called in. Silkwood, who, however, was more worried about the plutonium inside her than on the cheese and bologna. I mean, rightfully so. I feel like she was justified. She kept popping the quaaludes that had been prescribed a few weeks before. The quaaludes were just supposed to, to be taken for sleeping at night, but she was using them during the day just to calm down. And they gr- glowed green. <laughs> they probably did. On Sunday, November 10th. No, they were fine. She got them from her doctor. Um, five days after her first contamination, she boarded a Braniff airliner um, to fly to Los Alamos. That same morning, a fr- she was going there for more tests. The same uh, morning, a front page New York story reported that according to the AEC's own internal documents, the AEC had, re- quote, repeatedly, repeatedly <laughs> sought to suppress studies by its own scientists that found nuclear reactors were more dangerous than officially acknowledged or that raised questions about reactor safety devices. One AEC study kept confidential for seven years, so since the 60s, predicted that a major nuclear accident could kill up to 45,000 persons and pollute an area the size of Pennsylvania. And I believe at this point we're somewhere around like 10 of these facilities in the country. Man, we're lucking out right now. Yeah. So for two days, Karen underwent a whole body count a meticulous probing of skin, orifices, intestines, and lungs, urinating at intervals into plastic bottles, and pooping into freezette boxes. Is that like Tupperware? What is that? I don't know. I left the term in there. I'm assuming it's like a, like a yeah, Tupperware thing. Um, after the first day, Dr. George Bowles, uh, the health division leader, assured her that she had suffered no immediate damage. She was in no danger of dying from plutonium poisoning. That seems dubious. And I forgot to put it in there. I'm pretty sure this doctor is from the AEC. He's not from Kermagee. He's from the AEC because they kind of took over once they figured out about her apartment. So on Tuesday, November 12th, Karen called her mother to announce the good news about the test, but added... I'm still a little scared. I don't know how I got contaminated. I feel like someone's using me for a guinea pig. Her mom said, I told her to come home and she said she would. She just, she was ready for a vacation. She just had to do a couple things first. She had told, so Karen had told Wadka she would give him the evidence she was collecting as soon as she returned home from testing. And Wadka had set up a meeting with her and David Burnham, the Times reporter, Uh, the meeting was scheduled for Wednesday night at the Holiday Inn Northwest in Oklahoma City. Wednesday morning, Silkwood drove to work. Uh, Contract negotiations between local uh, union and Kerr McGee had begun the week before, and as a committee woman, she was supposed to take part in the bargaining. She spent the morning in negotiation, arguing the union's demands for uh, for for better safety training and higher injury benefits. In the afternoon, she met with several. Uh, she met for several hours with AEC inspectors who were trying to unravel the mystery of her contamination. Still, at 5:15, she drove to Crescent, about five miles from the plant, and stopped at the Hub Cafe for for a dinner meeting to discuss negotiation strategy with the local union. Silkwood excused herself about six o'clock to telephone Stevens, her on again, off again boyfriend at the time, uh, who was also an activist reminding him to pick up Wadka and Burnham at the airport and to expect her at the motel or at the motor hotel about eight o'clock. She sounded normal, Stevens remembered, perhaps a bit excited about having an audience with the New York Times. At 7.15, uh, Karen Silkwood left the Hub Cafe and headed for Highway 74 and the Holiday Inn Northwest. A fellow union member would later swear in an affidavit that Silkwood, minutes before she left the restaurant, was carrying a manila folder an inch thick with papers. The, the folder, Silkwood told the union members, contained proof 
that quality control uh, records were being falsified at the plant. Oh, she's like a oh, she's like a hero, man. Mm-hmm. That's remember she was doing all that spying for like yeah, a whole no, time. I know it's just it's cool. It's like she's a real spy. She's got her folder. So this is the thing, Mo. It's seven thirty on November thirteenth. Silkwood's de- detective work ended very abruptly, abruptly when she smashed her car into a, con- a concrete culvert. Oh. Ah! Really? Yep. Where, okay, let me guess. Folder missing. We're going to get there. Uh. 30 miles away, Wadka, Burnham, and Stevens waited for the proof until 845. Then they picked up the phone. But for some reason... The, ho- the Holiday Inn lines, phone lines, were out of order, and another oh. hour passed before they could make the call. Meanwhile, at 8.05, a truck driver <laughs> sitting... <laughs> what? A maid brought them cheese and bologna sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, meanwhile, at 8.05, a truck driver sitting high up in his cab and rolling along the two-way highway spotted a, spotted a white Honda, Karen's white Honda, almost hidden in the muddy culvert. Silkwood had traveled about seven miles from the Hub Cafe, about a 10-minute drive. So she'd only gotten 10 minutes from this cafe where she Man. ate, talking to people. Like, she just had a meeting. Like, What, did they cut her brakes? Like, how did they... We're going to get to that. Okay. By the time Stevens, Watkin, Burnham learned the news from a local union member... The Honda Civic hatchback already had been towed to Crescent, and Silkwood had been pronounced dead on arrival at Guthrie Hospital, the victim of multiple and compound fractures. Oh, man. The three men raced to the culvert, only a mile from the plutonium plant, and prowled about. Stepped gingerly through the mud, which in Oklahoma is the color of dry blood. All they could find were shards of aluminum trim, the orange roadside reflector that had been trampled by the bouncing car and Silkwood's uncashed paycheck. Later, they found the wreck locked up in Sebring's garage, uh, who was the tow truck driver, and peered at it through the window. They stopped at home at the home of Union Committee uh, man Jack Tice, one of the last to see Silkwood alive. Stephen Al- Stevens also called Silkwood's parents. Then when they returned to the culvert, searching for an explanation in the tire tracks and the scrapes of metal, or scraps of metal, the explanation uh, the state highway patrol offered was that Karen Silkwood, exhausted after driving 600 miles from Los Alamos to Oklahoma City, had fallen asleep and drifted off the road to an accidental death. Almost immediately, though, the police had to alter their official version when they were told that Silkwood had flown from Los Alamos and had gotten a full night's sleep. Did everyone in the 70s that. just make things? Did anyone do their job in the 70s? It doesn't look that way. It well, really folks, looks look. like the little lady was tired. Case closed. Yep. <laughs> that was the official, that was their initial response. They're like, well, she obviously passed out, right? Right. You ready to go home? I'm ready to go home. Case closed. Oklahoma. <laughs> the second official version was somewhat more convincing. Sometime during the afternoon of November 13th, Silkwood had gulped down at least one of the pasty white quaaludes from the vial in her coat pocket. I didn't even o- think about that. Oklahoma City's chief forensic toxicologist, Richard W. Prouty, discovered 0.35 milligrams of quaalude in her bloodstream. I assume that is a lot. No, that's not even a whole pill. Oh, okay, never mind. And trace amounts of alcohol, conceivably enough to lure her to sleep on the highway, according to the toxicologist. But that wasn't sufficient for Steve uh, Wadka. Silkwood had swallowed several quaaludes in the past week without nodding out. Why would she fall into a trance on her way to an extremely crucial meeting? And the proof of fraud she was supposedly carrying had disappeared. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Back to that folder, Dennis. Trooper Rick Fagan 
He had mentioned finding dozens of loose papers blowing about the accident scene when he first arrived. Fagan had plucked up the papers, he told his, superior, his superiors, and shoved them back into the Honda. According to the Highway, Patrol, uh, uh, the Highway Patrol's information officer, Lieutenant Kenneth Van Hoo, uh, the papers were in the Honda when Ted Sebring hauled the car away. Presumably, they would have still been there at 12.30 a.m. that night, five hours after the incident, when Sebring, the tow truck driver, unlocked his garage for a group of Kira McGee and AEC uh. representatives who said they wanted to check out Silkwood's car for plutonium contamination. The cop was also with them, um, Fagan. But the next afternoon, uh, when Stevens, Wadka, and Burnham claimed Silkwood's car uh, from, the, from Sebring, no papers were inside. Wadka called Tony uh, Mizuchi at Oka International, and three days after Silkwood's death, an auto crash expert arrived in Oklahoma City from the Accident Reconstruction Lab of Dallas. A.O. Pimpkin, Pipkin, an ex-cop and veteran of 2,000 accidents and 300 court trials. He was, like, the best guy. Like, as far as, like, figuring out what happened in a crash, this was the guy to go to at the time. Oh, yeah. So, Pipkin examined the Honda and found two curious dents, one in the rear bumper and another in the rear fender. They were fresh. There was no road dirt in them. And they appeared to have been made by a car bumper. She was run off the road. At the scene. Captain Obvious, I guess. (laughs) Well, it isn't obvious. Well, I think it is, and they just don't want to talk about it, really. At the scene, Pipkin noted that the Honda had crossed over the yellow lines and hit the culvert on the left side of the highway. If Silkwood had nodded into a stupor, though, he reasoned, she would have drifted to the right, into the red clay. Pipkin found something else the police apparently disregarded. Tire tracks indicating the car had been out of control way before it left the highway. Uh, so she was trying to keep control. She was, struck. She, she was awake. Yeah, that's basically the main thing. Well, and at one point she like goes down. It's like she's crossed over center and she's like on the other like side of the road. And she drives for a straight line before we'll get into a little bit more like she drives in a straight line though for a while also which doesn't make sense as far as if she had fallen asleep it wouldn't have been like well i'm still kind of maintaining this after i've drifted way over left well yeah so she had control if she was panicking yeah so pipkin's uh disconcerting conclusion karen silkwood's honda had been hit from the rear by another vehicle the same day he was doing all this Kier McGee's security chief, James Reading, began compiling a dossier on Pipkin. Reading phoned a cooperative captain in the New Mexico State Police Intelligence Division and hired Pinkerton Security, which it was really hard not for me to swerve off at the Pinkerton Security. We may That may be a fun thing to talk about at some point. I don't know if you know where they are. I've never Google. heard of them. Oh, okay. you should go for them. They're a, they're a fun bunch of rascals. Uh, the only innuendo they dredged up, though, when they investigated uh, Pipkin was uh, that he had there were unsubstantiated reports that he might have had IRS problems like 20 years before in 1955. Starting a dossier on an accident reconstruction is a totally normal thing to do. I know. Doesn't that, that seems like a very normal thing. You're right. Yeah. Reading later claimed that Kieran McGee needed the dossier for a lawsuit the company expected to be filed on behalf of Karen Silkwood. Oh. They didn't want her death turned into an anti-company rallying point, which I'm not sure why anybody would think that if you weren't involved in her murder. Yeah, it's not like she died from plutonium. You should be, like, thanking your lucky stars that she was either murdered or... You know what I mean? Or fell asleep or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you're maybe getting out in front of something, though. So no Kerr McGee official uh, made the journey to Texas for Karen Selkwood's funeral. Nor anybody from the AEC. On December 20th, five weeks after Karen Silkwood's death, Kerr McGee temporarily closed its plutonium plant. These were trying days for the company 
Supporters of Cure McGee found it necessary to print ads reminding Oklahomans that Dunn and Bradstreet, Bradstreet had recently named Cure McGee among the five best managed corporations in the country. That's what <laughs> what was going on at these other nuclear plants. That's a, <laughs> no, just corporations. That's a, I don't even think we're talking about power plants. I think we're talking about just corporations. I period. know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> What's going on at these other... Unless the other four were the other power plants, like... Uh, oh, they're not good either. Like, I, I try I not assume. to figure off on that, that. Nobody is really doing a good job with any kind of atomic splitting uranium, plutonium, bad stuff. <laughs> Nobody's really taking the precautions and treating it with the seriousness that you would kind of expect from people that deal with this stuff all the time. So... On to, like I said, after Silk was, uh, they temporarily closed the plant uh, and they started running the propaganda stuff. But even with their attempt to kind of make themselves look good, headlines kept popping up all over. Thanks to the New York Times wire service telling of a mysterious death, falsified records, and ill-trained workers sent in uh, to, the, to handle one of the world's most dangerous poisons. So New York Times is just churning stuff out at this point. Like they are just bringing scabs in. Nobody knows what's happening. People are dying for no reason in weird circumstances. Uh, predictably, the plant shut down, ruptured the tentative alliance between the plutonium workers and local environmentalists. To Eileen Younghine, the shutdown uh, was a first step to victory. To Frank Murch, a middle-aged man with seven years invested in Kerr McGee. It was a slap in the pocket pocketbook. He said, quote, you're right. I'm bitter about this. I'm bitter at the environmentalists. It's a hell of a thing putting this many people out of work. I mean, oh, wow. So some things never change just as a human no. condition. Some things just never change. And that's all the more I'm going to say about that. <laughs> some took to blaming the dead directly. One worker who earlier had talked about honoring Karen Silkwood with a special grave marker spat at the mention of her name. Attitude change, said uh, Silkwood's co uh, council member, uh, Gerald Brewer. People started to blame Karen for getting thrown out of work right before the holidays. What is it about? Oh, it was the stories. Okay. It's the story, but again, yeah. she got... She died under mysterious circumstances like five weeks ago, and you think that's why you just got laid off. Right. I mean, it is it is related, but it's weird that that's where you point your anger. Not the company that's laying you off. Public relations, man. The public relations around the horror factory that you work in. Like, that's the weird part. I'm like, aren't you, has nobody told you about plutonium yet? Like, it's like these guys are just like, nah, it's no big deal. It's like Guys, oil, pretty much. I'm sorry we gotta lay you off for the holidays. We're gonna give each one of you a bag of plutonium for families. <laughs> so the holidays came and went, and in early January, after plutonium production resumed at the plant, they started back up. Brewer was demoted from his job, and two weeks later, he got fired. There was no official explanation. Hmm. Brewer's apparent sin, though, was that he refused to submit to a polygraph test that asked questions like, have you ever talked to the media? Although of questionable legality, the polygraphs were required of most plutonium workers as, quote, a security precaution before they could return to their jobs. A Kerr <laughs> McGee official described company strategy in a conversation with the Daily Oklahoman, quote, we're going to tool back up slowly and hire people who are trustworthy and are not involved in the union. As for undesirables, you don't have to tell them anything. You can just say, you didn't clear security. Problem solved. It's genius. I mean, I'm sure this guy was getting paid very well at the time for that kind of just stroke of genius. Mm -hmm. Along with Brewer, five other workers who snubbed or failed the polygraph were handed pink slips. Jack Tice, again, the other, Karen was on the committee with three, three, two other guys, three of them total. They went to Washington to talk to the AC. Jack Tice is the third member of that. Uh, 
he gets he, he uh, gets transferred to the most isolated part of the plant, which I I don't know what that meant. It's apparently <laughs> maybe worse than the cold warehouse. I'm not sure. <laughs> Is that like a closet? Like I don't know. <laughs> Um, among the six was also Dusty Ellis, Karen's roommate at the apartment that got contaminated. After Silkwood's death, Ellis initially cooperated with Kier McGee, refusing to talk to, the, to either the union or the media. At one point, she was seen red-eyed and distraught, being escorted by two company detectives away from the Edmund Broadway Motor Inn, where she had been staying, compliments of Kier McGee. Then Ellis, without explanation, aired a suggestion that Silkwood may have been stealing plutonium from the plant. I knew they were going to accuse her of that. Uh... It was only a matter of time based on everything that was happening. Shortly thereafter, Kier McGee reportedly offered Ellis $1,000 as payment for any claims she might have against the company. So anything you might think of that you want to tell people about? Hires a grand, just don't do that. Just yeah. take the $1,000 and we'll just never talk again. She turned down the money, though, because she began to worry that she had been seriously contaminated when uh, her gums bother, her gums ended up bothering her and she had a lot of trouble sleeping. In late December, she hired a lawyer and threatened to sue the company for copies of her health records. Three weeks later, though, she was fired. Two weeks after that, in early February... Ellis told friends that twice someone had tried and failed to break into her new apartment. Bro, these nuclear companies out here killing people, man. It's really looking that way. There's a pattern for me. Did this ever get fixed? Okay, I don't know. All right, keep going. Yeah, this is terrifying. During the month between the plant shutdown and the firings, the AEC had published the results of its investigation. According to a daily Oklahoman story, Kira McGee officials received a copy of the report well ahead of its official release, which is apparently in violation of AEC's own rules. Company officials who had been refusing comment since Karen Silkwood's de death except to say, quote, we will let the AEC speak for us and pronounce themselves pleased with the findings when they came out. On the question of falsified records, the AEC did locate one former worker who admitted to using a felt-tip pen to touch up photo negatives that measured the welding on plutonium fuel rods. The worker, however, said he acted only to make his job easier and not under orders from Kara McGee. That's a $1,000 check. Oh, easily, yeah. Without Silkwood's documents, the AEC reported it could find no other hard proof. But the union questioned whether the AEC was really even looking. According to the union, the AEC lied when it claimed to have had it, it claimed to have interviewed a worker who disputed Silkwood's allegations of the fraud. This worker, uh, Oka says, had given the union a sworn affidavit that the AEC never interviewed him, and that he believes quality controls were not adequate. So the exact opposite of what. Kier McGee's saying. That'd be weird to just it's read your name in this thing. Yeah, I know, right? Hey, wait, I said what? I Either that, that or he took a bribe and did say it, and then he was felt embarrassed with the union. That's also possible, too. I mean, at this point, there aren't a lot of good people in this story. <laughs> um, on the plan, uh, the question of plant safety, the AEC reported the 20 of the 39 grievances it examined were true or partially true. Plutonium had been stored in desk drawers instead of a prescribed vault. That was true. In various incidents, employees had been forced to work in areas not tested for contaminations or, you know, where they knew leaks were and were still going on. In another, the company failed to report a serious leak that had forced it to close the plant in May 1974, just before Karen got there. Generally, respirators had not been checked regularly for deficiencies, Few workers had also been properly trained. So AEC finds all that to be true. Oh, that's all the stuff that they found in their report after this investigation. Like, all that stuff was happening over the last year. Like, they'd been investigating for a little bit. It just kept building. So such disregard for safety, you would think, okay, the AEC is going to clamp down now, right? Right. The AEC decided that all this merited no censure 
uh, beyond adding these new citations to the drove already in Kira McGee's files. Kira McGee was free to resume its role at its uh, in its uh, AEC's fast breeding program. Oh yeah, they're making uh, the Blutonian pellets for the AEC. Oh yeah, I think you mentioned that earlier. I, I don't know if I mentioned that, but I just want to remind you, they're the plant's biggest customer. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I, yeah. Yeah, I was confused. They're the government. They're who's handling the government contracts of all <sighs> this. They're also who's checking. I'm just at the beat down point of this story where I'm just like, of course they are. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Who else did they kill? <laughs> um, so they get to start resuming the fast breeding program for the AEC. And this is a program that might have been seriously compromised had Kier McGee been forced to close up shop permanently. It would have messed the AEC up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think you can't conflict. let them. Yeah, you can't. Obviously, a conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Young Hine and the other envi environmentalists profess no surprise at the AEC's lack of action. The AEC had never summoned the courage to penalize Kerr McGee in the past. The AEC had managed to levy only eight penalties during a 12 month period between 1973 and 1974, even though its inspectors had found 3,333 oh, violations. Oh, my God. <laughs> How is everybody not dead that's involved in this? I think they all got cancer a lot later, honestly. I'm like, sure a it, bunch of people it, did. Yeah. Honestly, I bet, and it's there would be no way to tell because, I mean, if you look at the effort they're going to at this point, like, you're never going to find that out. They paid these people probably at some point, anybody that got sick. Or they acted like they didn't know, like they did to the Navajo. Well, I don't know where that would have happened at. This has been, again, it's going to take 10 to 15 years before they even figure out they have cancer. Right. So much can happen in 10 to 15 years that we can say isn't Kira McGee. Everybody smoked back then? That's also true. There's so many other things to blame it on. So, in 1972, during a hearing on nuclear safety, the AEC had given its scientists written instructions to, quote, Never disagree with established policy. And at a nuclear waste dump uh, in Washington that the AEC had been in charge of. And while it was in charge, a half a million gallons of hot effluent, uh, enough to fill four railroad cars, Dennis. Uh, back to your, uh, is there more than a softball? Yes, there's more than a softball. Four railroad cars worth That's had spilled onto the ground in numerous accidents since the 1940s, the whole time we've been using it. Oh. All right. Including, there was one leak one time that I just, I, I, I was going to leave it out, but it just, it hurt so much I had to hurt you too. 115,000 gallons linked out, leaked out of a tank and went unnoticed for 51 days while it did so. At one of these plants? Uh, this is like in transportation, I believe, or in like a container that would be transported. Over the years, the AEC had shrugged at multiple warnings that should have sounded sirens. A study by two AEC scientists in 1969 that predicted 32,000 more annual deaths from cancer if every American were exposed to the allowable radiation doses set by the AEC. An AEC laboratory test in 1970 in which the key emergency safety system for conventional nuclear reactors failed to work in six of six attempts. <laughs> so they it never doesn't got work. To work. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. work. It doesn't work at all. There were 271 fires and 410 contamination cases at the AEC's only facility for mass production of plutonium that they were doing themselves, or for the parts, there's plutonium parts used in atomic in atom bombs. So we just had no other choice. We're like, we got to keep making these bombs. Yep. Eight miles upwind from Denver, Colorado. That's why Denver is so weird. Actually, I love Denver. I love Denver, but it explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> in May 1969, this plant harbored the most expensive fire in industrial history. Improperly stored cans of plutonium ignited and destroyed $50 million worth of delicate equipment. 
Over a year later, General E.B. Giller, director of the AEC's Division of Military Applications, admitted the fire had been, quote, a near catastrophe. Had it burned through the roof of that facility, and it nearly did, hundreds of square miles could have been involved in radiation explosion. Oh, boy. Let's put that nine miles away from a big city. Does that sound like a good idea? Sounds like a great idea. Let's hundreds of miles. <clears throat> yep. In January 1975, so back up into Karen's story. So a couple months after she's died, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol reopened the Silkwood case for six days. They re-examined evidence and reached pretty much the same conclusion. Actually, they couldn't examine all the evidence because along Highway 74, the Honda's tire tracks had been sloshed away by a tractor grader reportedly less than 24 hours after Pipkin had inspected the scene. So two days after, or I think that's what, four, four or five days after the wreck, essentially. Pretty fast. Really fast. And right after this investigator shows up. And remember, the head of security at Kira McGee was investigating that guy. So they knew he was there. They knew what he was doing. And the next day after he's done, it's getting paved over. <laughs> so the street of the highway had been repaved on one side. It, this made it difficult to tell in which direction a sleepy driver might actually drift now. The Honda All of this the, happened in like, okay. No, like a week. Wow. All yeah, right. Happened. Yep. Yep. Gosh, imagine the power these people have. A lot. They're in your home putting plutonium I, in your sandwich. I think I took the quote out. Uh, there was a Oklahoma, I forget what level of government he was at, maybe a councilman or something, who compared um, Keir McGee, at, I think he was talking about McGee himself. Uh, he compared McGee to like uh, the Rockefellers in New York. Oh, yeah. Everybody sure. looks Oh, up yeah, he was governor, wasn't he? I forgot about that. that. Was Kerr, uh, Kerr was the, yeah, McGee was the governor, I believe. And yeah. Kerr was the senator. Man. Or was Kerr, Kerr, it might have been Kerr that was the, I have to look, Kerr was like a governor. He was in state uh, government. I think he was the governor and then the senator. That's right, because he was frugal when he started out in the state. McGee was, he was on different councils. He was also in government, but I don't think he was governor at any point. Anyway, so there's not really much left for the police to go off of at this point. The Honda wasn't reliable, they said, because it hadn't been in their possession for a while. So they can't really use it. At the request of Oka International, however, three other auto crash experts scrutinized the car. All three agreed with Pipkin that the dents could not have been caused by the concrete culvert. Dr. E.L. Martin of Albuquerque, New Mexico, who put the Honda bumper under a microscope, said the bumper dent resulted from, quote, contact between two metal surfaces. It is highly probable, according to these experts, that another car slammed into the Honda as Silkwood drove towards the Holiday Inn in the Northwest. At Oka headquarters, Wadka found it difficult to return to his other chores. The Silkwood kit case just kept nagging him. How did Silkwood become, become contaminated a week before her death? Four weeks afterwards, Wadka kept the results of her Los Alamos tests scribbled on an Oka blackboard, trying to puzzle out the uh, mystery. The most logical explanation he decided was Silkwood had been contaminated at the plant and then knowingly carried the plutonium home with her. But then the AEC report reported that this would have been virtually impossible, given her duties at the plant during the time immediately preceding her contamination. Wadka reluctantly came to believe she must have been poisoned then. That would be terrifying to still be working there. Yeah. Well, he doesn't work there. He's in the uh, AEC. He's in Washington. Yeah, I know. But I mean, but, yeah, if he's... you were there and somebody had died, or if you were part of the union. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's at the Union. Sorry, he's at the Union. Yeah. He's not in AEW. I mean, right? you're working there. Now you know you could get sick, but then also yeah. you know you might get yeah, killed. Yeah, if you keep poking around at these people, you might die. I'm going to go back to the farm, man. Extra plutonium apparently 
had been added to four of the urine samples Silkwood gave to Kira McGee for analysis in late October and early November. Wadka, when he was pondering this, said, I think someone tampered with these samples, hoping to get her out of the plant or at least confuse the issue. Kerr-McGee officials uh, at this time advanced a little bit different conspiracy theory on what was going on. They thought that Silkwood contaminated herself to embarrass the company. According to this theory, Silkwood smuggled a plutonium capsule out of the plant, either by swallowing it or <laughs> slipping it up her vagina or anus. They had to make it embarrassing for her. All of which, Dennis, would have actually been suicidal maneuvers. Like, That's your so body dumb. That. Right, she's going to expose you by doing something that she knows could kill her. Yeah, that's... And it would be extremely obvious that that's what you did, like, in that concentration level. So, um, they cited as evidence the coincidence that Silkwood was first contaminated November 5th, the day before the company was to begin a new contract negotiation. But even assuming Silkwood had become a frenzied zealot, this theory does not explain why she thought getting contaminated in her apartment would embarrass the company mm-hmm. or why the company would get red faced over any contamination after 73 cases in the last four years. Right. What's one more? Nonetheless, though, Oklahoma City media popularized this theory. A year later now, After Karen Silkwood's death remained a mystery, the FBI went ahead and closed the case, leaving many questions officially unanswered. Then the top executive of the company that employed Silkwood interfered with a congressional reopening of the case, and the Justice Justice Department joined in hamstringing that inquiry. And that, Dennis, is actually, I'm going to, this is where we're going to leave it off at this episode this is going to be our first two-parter there was just too much like the investigation that happens after this there was just there was no way to boil it down it wouldn't have done karen justice it wouldn't have done any of these people involved justice well it's not our first two-parter but that's oh man it isn't we have freemasons well, but this is one continuous story. Oh, I get what you're saying. Like, we're going to pick back up what's, lost his mind. With what's going on with the FBI uh, dropping their investigation and who steps in. Because remember, there's all these other players oh my gosh. Still involved that aren't satisfied with the fact that everybody's just saying, well, it was an accident. She must have done some drugs. That lady there's, was murdered. Yes. I, I, I think, yeah. My gosh, man. I hope this ends with this stuff. I mostly care about myself, <laughs> so, so I just want to. I just want to find out that I'm not going to die in one of these fires that blows off a roof. And I'm. I don't know that you're going to get that comfort in the second half of this, Dennis. Oh, this makes me so unhappy. <laughs> You've thoroughly dissatisfied me. <laughs> good research. Good. Good job, man. Good job. Man, honestly, there was so many, really, there was a lot of, like, good reporters. The Rolling Stone really hit this hard. The Washington Post hit it really hard. Like, there was just a handful of, and the New York Times really, really hit it hard. At one point, the, you'll find out later, the Washington Post kind of backs off of it. New York Post, or New York Times keeps going with it. Like, there was just a handful of people, and later on, they kept making enough noise that it got more and more attention. And yeah. we're going to find out more about that on the next one, but... Well, this is like the perfect story for like 1975 because you got like you're right after Watergate, so like nobody yep. trusts anybody, and then you got nuclear stuff, and then you got environmentalism, and you got this woman who's like a super spy. Yeah, it's uh so, quite the well, story. Think about all the other stuff we've talked about on this show that was swirling in the 70s. Um, I mean, yeah. the, I mean, this was like the time to distrust the government and distrust. Well, the, like, our yeah, people. Scientology was busy infiltrating the IRS about this time. I think, if I remember right, <laughs> or getting right, they were infiltrating government. I don't know going if going on in the seventies, man. Remember that there was that was yeah. going on. Yeah, we had like we're a few years before the alien encounter by the uh, police officer in Minnesota. <laughs> on our that was in seventy nine, man. Oh, this nineteen seventies. Yeah, this is nuts, man. 
And don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna hear more from our old buddies. You know, the CIA might pop up a little bit. The FBI is gonna pop up more. Just all. Yeah, the... I suspect things are gonna get crazier rather than less crazy at this point. Yeah, I, this was a lot of setup. It was kind of a uh, Karen. Uh, while she is the heart of the story and why everything happens, her death is kind of just the first act in what's going on with Kerr McGee. Really, this show is about Kerr McGee and how horrible they were in the 1960s and 70s. Really, next episode: Revenge of the Kerr McGee. <laughs> Kerr McGee strikes back. So thank you all so much for listening, and this is the first one where I guess we could, I guess I was able to say that we had Freemason stuff coming up. This is the first one where, like, you, you, we know what's coming up in the next one, which is more Karen Silkwood investigation. Ooh. So tune in next time for that. Dennis, thank you so much for letting me depress you and scare you about the world all around you. Watch it's out for the plutonium do. dust. <laughs> Thanks. You too, buddy. Love you. Bye. Love you.